The reading for this morning is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5, verses 1 through 12. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up to the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to speak and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you, and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. This is the Gospel of Christ. Our congregation for the month of February will be beginning a visioning process where we will all sit together and discuss what the vision of our church will be as we move into the future during this uncertain time. We're looking at the visioning meetings being planned uh, following the service in the West Parlor. I've begun this process of discernment and visioning for this congregation because we are truly living in an unprecedented time and the church is changing at a very rapid rate due to the COVID pandemic. I know a lot of us are already talking about the post-pandemic church. However, the virus is still with us and continues to affect our everyday lives as well as the life of the church. I recently attended a clergy retreat in Newton, Iowa hosted by the Disciples of Christ, where other UCC pastors were also in attendance. And during the conference, I listened to stories of other pastors from all four of the surrounding states, and they all affirmed pretty much the same thing, that the change has been rapid and is still ongoing. Even when the pandemic does eventually end, the changes that have happened during COVID will still be with us and will have made an impact, a pretty dramatic one, upon the church. I think it's important that uh, we as a church discuss this and think about where it is that we will be go moving forward as we move into uh, this future. A future that nobody uh, really knows. There are some hints. I don't even know myself. One of the first steps the church can do when they begin a visioning process is to think about their mission statement. And that's why I included it at the beginning of our worship service. And we'll include it throughout the month of February. This morning we'll be looking at Jesus' mission statement, which is the Beatitudes. And how we can embody those Beatitudes in our everyday lives as Christians. At the end of my message today, I would like to invite the congregation to think about how you would envision the blessed life that you are called to as Christians. What does the blessing mean to you? And how you embody it. And then I will ask for your feedback at the conclusion of my message. The Beatitudes are part of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. They are the first set of five teachings that Jesus gave to his earliest followers. They are eight blessings that Jesus proclaims on people who would not have been considered blessed by the culture of their day nor our own. This, for me, is Jesus' 
inaugural address. If there is one passage of scripture that sums up all of Jesus' tradition, what is Jesus really all about? The Sermon on the Mount, and it begins with these Beatitudes. For me, and I'm sure for most Christians, this is the most central place. But it's interesting that uh, some Christians uh, in the past, at one point, thought it was the Ten Commandments that needed to be the most central teaching of the church. I'm sure we can all remember those stories on TV of should the Ten Commandments be placed on the courthouse steps or not. And I can remember uh, one occasion watching the television set where the reporter asked the politician who was kind of supportive of the Ten Commandments being on the front of the courthouse steps, well, can you name all ten of the commandments? And he says, well, I'm not sure. I remember the one about adultery, though. <laughs> the word blessed has been transla is translated into English from the Greek as makarios, which is tended to be translated as happy or fortunate. Now, my former professor in seminary, Dr. Mike Graves, and uh, his colleague, Dr. May, say in their commentary on Matthew that this is really a mistranslation. The better translation of Makarios, which takes into account its historical context, is esteem or honor. The culture of that time was built around an honor-shame system. Those who had honor or who were esteemed were not the kinds of people that Jesus lists in the eight Beatitudes according to that time, the poor in spirit, those who mourn, the meek, the hungry, and those who thirst for righteousness, the merciful, the pure in heart, the peacemakers, and those persecuted for righteousness. The honorable and the esteemed were those who had status or were in power, like the emperor or the king. Jesus is turning this whole concept of what it means to be blessed upside down on its head. In order to understand the full weight of what Jesus is implying, we have to go back to Jesus' earlier proclamation at the very beginning of the Gospel of Matthew because it connects with what he's saying in these eight Beatitudes. So at the beginning of Matthew, in his first proclamation, Jesus says, From that time, Jesus says, From that time, Jesus began to proclaim, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. UCC pastor Dr. Eric Elvis points out that this too is an unfortunate mistranslation of the original Greek. He knows that the passage should read like this: the kingdom of heaven. Matthew or God, Mark, is already here. Change your whole way of thinking and believe in the good news. The word for repentance in Greek, which is metanoia, which means a complete and total reorientation towards life. And the Greek word for drawing near means that it's a past event that continues to have ongoing significance in the present. It's not a future event that hasn't happened yet. So when Jesus says that the kingdom of heaven is theirs in the Beatitudes, and then in his opening declaration says that it's going on right now, this causes us to have to completely reevaluate what heaven is, or at least this portion of heaven here on earth. You can kind of understand, well, some of his followers or people that were with him got a little upset possibly when he said this because well, how can that be? There's still suffering, heartache, pain. Everything is in the world as it was before. The emperor is still in charge. But it connects with the Lord's Prayer. We make this proclamation every Sunday. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We tend to think of heaven as a place um, as at the absence of suffering and pain. 
However, Jesus, it seems to me, is saying that heaven is discovered or found in the midst of pain, hardship, and suffering. During the retreat, uh, we watched a documentary called Justice for Brian Stevenson. It was a HBO documentary. And uh, it was part of our requirement to fulfill our anti-racism and pro-reconciliation class that we take every three years as ministers. And when I viewed the film with my minister colleagues, I felt that it really demonstrated what it looks like to embody the Beatitudes of Jesus. Brian Stevenson was an African-American defense lawyer who had been defending death penalty clients all the way up to the Supreme Court. And several of the cases that he argued at the Supreme Court had resulted in the death penalty being prohibited for youthful offenders, as well as those who had severe learning or intellectual disabilities. Brian grew up in the segregated South. His first memories as a child were swimming in the community swimming pool, not knowing that's where he wasn't supposed to be seeing all of the adult white parents rushing to the pool to snatch their children out of the pool because they were in the same pool as an African-American child. And as he remembers this experience, he remembers an older white man standing over him saying, you're wrong, and it calls him the N-word. It was what happened towards the end of the film, though, that caught my attention. He had, had been defending a death row client that had severe mental and intellectual disabilities, and he was scheduled to be executed. The client appeared, appeals, the appeals had failed. He filed for consideration by the U.S. Supreme Court, and it was turned down. The client called in one last time, letting him know that he knew he was going to die, and began to cry. It was at this time Stevenson said, I can't do this anymore. But then after he thought about it for a bit, he realized, he came to the revelation that while the system is broken and his clients are broken, he could not stop doing the work that he was called to do. He identified with the client he realized that he was broken as well. He identified with the client and the problems of society in such a way that he knew he could not stop doing what God had called him to do. It was a part of who he was as a blessed child of God. I believe that what it looks like, this is what it looks like when you embody these beatitudes which were proclaimed by Jesus. Have you felt that same kind of blessing or identification with the less fortunate that you have encountered? Perhaps when you have worked with someone in need during one of our food shares or free rummages, this is what embodying the beatitudes means all of us are blessed during hard times, and God is found in the midst of our struggles. When we identify with that struggle and work alongside of others who are going through the same thing, God is found in the midst of that. This is where we find a blessed life. And now I would like for each of you to just take a few minutes and ponder the question I raised at the beginning of, of my message. How do you envision the blessed life that we are called to as Christians? And how do you or we embody it? And if you want to discuss this in a group or with your neighbor sitting around you, feel free to do so. But let's just take a couple of minutes and then we'll uh, I'll come back and uh, hear what your responses are. 